So I recently had the chance to go on the podcast, To Whom Shall We Go?, with my friend Ryan Sorensen. In it, we talked about faith and how I deal with issues of fallibility regarding church leaders, as well as other topics. Anyway, it was a fun conversation, so I figured I'd share it. I hope you guys enjoy. Welcome back, everyone. This is the To Whom Shall We Go podcast. This is your host, Ryan Sorensen. Today, we have Jacob Hansen joining us. Thanks so much for being on, Jacob. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate uh, the invitation. So to get us started, um, could you give us a little bit of, of a kind of, of a background behind kind of your journey um, as a Latter Day Saint, and kind of working that eventually into kind of the the faith remodeling that you eventually went through? Yeah, yeah. So I uh, I grew up in a kind of one of those big multi generational Latter Day Saint families. My mom's actually a convert, but on my dad's side, we go back quite a ways. Um, and yeah, just, I have eight siblings. Um, and over time, I now am the only one of my eight siblings that's still active in the church. So I've been front and center with the, you know, people leaving the church. When I went on my mission, essentially left with all my siblings active in the church. By the time I came home, um, my older brother had left and then eventually others. And anyway, it was, it's, it's been a process that basically from about 2000, and eight until about maybe a year or two ago, uh, one by one, my siblings have left for a variety of reasons. And, and this process caused me also to, you know, begin to examine real critically the things that I believe. Um, and so I, I, I tell people I never had a faith crisis, but that I had a faith remodeling. And that journey was largely, I went back down to the roots of my beliefs, which I think is something that a lot of people don't do. They, they start to look at things in like the CES letter or something, and they, they get all obsessed with sort of Joseph Smith and that story. And is that, you know, is it true? And what about polygamy and all these different kinds of things? And I, to me, it's like, there's a different way of approaching it. And you actually have to go and start with your question. Do you believe in God? Like, do you believe that there's a higher power? And have you ever actually like, thought deeply about that question. Because if there's a God, and if Jesus Christ was who the New Testament claims that he was, the Joseph Smith story becomes way more plausible, despite all the issues. It's like, once you believe that miracles are possible, once you believe that angelic visitations are not only something that might happen, but almost should be expected if Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be, it's sort of like the whole thing sort of gets changed around and you end up realizing that a lot of people's problems with the church are because they don't actually have a Christian or a a strong Christian or a strong theistic foundation under them. And so, you know, people use the analogy of the shelf and that their shelf breaks because they put all these doubts on it. One of the problems is people have a very weak shelf to put things on (laughs) because you don't, you've never really arrived at a firm reason that you believe in God or a firm reason that you believe that Jesus Christ in the New Testament was who he claimed to be. Because the church itself, I was, I talk about these three levels of conversation, the conversation about God. Then once you have had that conversation, then you're like, okay, I believe in God. You go to the next conversation, which I call level two, which is where you're talking about, okay, well, where is God in the world? And I think that leads you to the, sort of the Jesus Christ of the New Testament. And then Joseph Smith's story only makes sense within the light of conversation two within the the light of the idea that Jesus Christ was indeed the savior of the world. And I have chosen to be a Latter-day Saint and continue to be a Latter-day Saint because it is the, it is the narrative about Christianity that I find the most compelling. I'm fundamentally a Christian first. And then out of that, I go, okay, well, if you're, if you're a believer in this new Testament, Jesus, where is he? And if you look at our history, that's what our converts were. All the all the people who came to the church were Christians fundamentally who were seeking Christ's church. Like, what is Christ up to today? Does he have an institution? And that is the great message of the restoration is that, yes, indeed, he has an institution. The New Testament model has been restored. Um and that's kind of what we're about. And so by going through this sort of faith remodeling from the foundations up, 
I was able to really find that these issues of things in the Joseph Smith story or other aspects that can be tricky are they're there. They exist. They're not, it's not like they don't matter. It's just that they get put into a context where they become much smaller. They're more like puzzles. You got to figure out, but you know, at the end of the day that like, okay, this puzzle is a good puzzle. I just have some pieces. I don't quite have all the answers to yet. And, and even that is just, I, I've a lot of those get shrunk, but when you approach it from that perspective, from a firm foundation, um, the whole process gets a lot easier. I love that. And Jake, for those of you that aren't familiar with Jacob Hansen, he has a YouTube channel called A Thoughtful Faith. And he's talked pretty in depth about kind of these, these different quick, levels. Quick so we'll make sure to put a link in for that. It, it's actually, just so everyone knows, it's Thoughtful Faith. A Thoughtful Faith is actually a different podcast. I didn't even know oh, that that channel existed. Okay. So Thoughtful Faith. Make so sure just get that Thoughtful right. Faith. Yeah. Okay. I'm... So yeah, let's kind of dig a little bit deeper into this. So you mentioned kind of the first conversation um, essentially is, is there a God? And maybe just briefly, like what were some of the the biggest things that helped you feel confidence um, in terms of being a theist rather than being an atheist? It's funny. Um, my answer on that has changed over the years, um, not because there haven't been good answers because there's been a lot of good answers. <laughs> um, a lot of things that convince me that it, it's far more rational to believe um, in the proposition that there exists some sort of a higher power in the universe than the other proposition that there is not. Um, and I would say that that conversation I tell people really um, is a result of a look inward into myself has been where I've gotten the biggest. Um, uh, the, it, it's sort of like, I know that I exist and that's weird. Right. Um, and, and when you ask some of these questions, I mean, there's a lot to this. Some of the big arguments that I've found most compelling is. Oh. Okay. Um, having technical difficulties, but. Um, I think where we left off in terms of where I could hear you, um, you mentioned that that there were a lot of different reasons for believing in theism and kind of those reasons have evolved um, throughout time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and so, I, you know, I, I kind of have this collective witness model that helps me to kind of navigate reality. That's kind of actually where I start the conversation is because how do you know anything, right? So you got to kind of do that first. And I kind of have different tools that I believe we have that help us to understand the nature of reality. So if we want to know if God is part of reality, we got to utilize the, we got to look at what are the tools that we have at our disposal to even be able to answer that question if he exists, right? So I even almost say that the before you even have the first conversation, you first got to like lay out the ground rules of how you go about discovering the truth about reality itself, um, which is a whole nother conversation. But when it comes to God, I think that, you know, my, let's just start with my intuitive experience, right? You can say that I've had experiences that, you know, that intuitively to me, and I would say, if you look at all of humanity, like humanity intuitively believes in a higher power. It's just sort of innately within us to believe that it's almost a struggle against it to go the other direction. Um, so I would say, you know, your intuitions there, obviously, um, but also there are other arguments. Like I think there's lots of good arguments from reason. So rationally speaking, like, I don't think that I am just a material being. Um, I think that that's just like the material explanation of me. And I tell people a lot of times that my journey to God started with looking at me and asking what, not who is God, but what am I? And what I came to realize is I think a much better model for explaining what I am fundamentally is found in spiritual descriptions and things like scriptures. And, and people kind of innately know that. Like people intuitively sort of understand that I am not a bunch of, you know, I'm not a chemical reaction playing itself out. I mean, yes, that's part of it, but that isn't the essence of who I am. And that immediately opens the door to sort of this window of like, well, wait a minute, reality seems to be far more 
like the, the 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 reality that I know the best me, my subjective conscious experience, it is connected to the physical world, but it is not fundamentally something physical. This is just the old mind body problem. And so again, I think that when you get there, it's it's like things become more and more complicated. But then there's specific positive arguments for God that even can be empirical in nature, uh, in the sense of the specified complexity of the universe, or what you might call the the fine tuning arguments. I find that there are very compelling reasons if you're going to like, how do you detect mind in the universe? Right. And then you look into things like specified complexity and the fine tuning argument. What you find is that there's fingerprints of intelligibility. The universe is intelligible. That's weird. <laughs> like, why is there something rather than nothing? I mean, there, there, you can look through, and this is the cool thing. Like, for Latter day Saints, you don't have to stay in the Latter day Saint tradition. In fact, we in the Latter day Saint tradition don't talk about this very much because we're in conversation three. The really interesting conversations that have been had, a lot of them have been had outside of our tradition by just general believing people throughout history who've made all sorts of wonderful arguments and ideas out there about God. So, you know, I recommend that people go out and, you know, I, I really enjoy, you know, C.S. Lewis. I really enjoy um, John Lennox, um, who's a, an Irish uh, uh, philosopher and theologian and, and scientist, mathematician, actually. Um Go listen to Stephen Meyer make his case for intelligent design in the universe. You know, there there are a lot of, and people don't have to agree with everything that these people say, but you're going to find that there's a lot of interesting wisdom. And the theist tradition is far, we have to remember as Latter-day Saints, we're not just, we're not just Latter-day Saints. We're also Christians and we're also theists. And so spend time getting to know the theistic ideas that are out there in the world. Um, there's a lot of great stuff. So, I mean, that's kind of my long answer. I mean, yeah. we did a whole episode on why <laughs> God exists. Obviously it's a very big conversation, but I, yeah. I found in that conversation that there were many great reasons to believe in God and, and then, you know, went on to other, other conversations after that. That's awesome. So we have that first, this guy, that first conversation, like you said, is kind of the, yeah, is there a God? Um, and then I think after that, it'd be kind of like, yeah, kind of the, what's the yeah kind of the jesus is it kind of the, the jesus discussion basically yeah so the next question that i always have as a theist and this is the big question to the general theist someone who's like I, okay i believe in some sort of a higher power right we have to ask okay so does that power in any way interact with the world and then it's sort of like okay now we're getting into a discussion of theology right we're talking about what is the nature of god and the first question you have to ask is, does God interact with the world in any way? Because if you say no to that question, you're not really a theist, you're a deist, which means you believe that there is some sort of a higher power, but he has no connection to the world. But to me, it's sort of like, well, that's no better than atheism. It's like, yeah, if he doesn't, ex if he doesn't interact with us, what's the point of really believing in him? <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, okay, cool. Like there's monkeys on some planet far away somewhere. Like it, it has no relevance to me. Um, Elder Christofferson had this great line in one of his talks where he said, and I think he was quoting someone else. He said, a God who does not demand anything of us is the functional equivalent of a God who does not exist. And so you end up in this situation where you go, okay, so what are the demands that God makes of me? What are the, what is the way that God interacts with the world? And theists believe, again, to, to distinguish between a deist and a theist, a theist believes in a God that makes demands of you, a God that interacts with the world in some way, a God that you have some sort of accountability to in some, some cosmic sense, right? And so what's interesting is, is, and then you can go out and you can look at what... What what I one of the ways that I've I've something's helped me a lot is that I don't look for the perfect explanation. I look for the best explanation. And what's funny is there's only so many options out there of serious explanations as to a God that interacts with the world. These are the major religions of the world. These are the ones that have, in many cases, for thousands of years, people have been really trying to figure out this God question, and. So I, I kind of step back and go, okay, well, what are the options? And there's probably way more options than this. And I'm perfectly willing to listen to anyone who wants to come and tell me their, to give me their 
theological model of the world. And this is also why I laugh at people who are sort of, well, maybe I shouldn't say I laugh at them, but I kind of can't help it. I don't find very compelling vague spiritualism because it kind of feels to me like you're just making up notions about God. If God actually interacts with the world, then there should be something outside of my own whims <laughs> that is like God is discoverable outside of me, like in the real world, moving within it in some way. And so I don't find the vague spiritualism, that whole category, very compelling. So I want to look for an explanation of God that is a God who is active in the world. And there's only so many really serious contenders, in my opinion, for that. You have kind of the major monotheistic religions, you have polytheistic religions, um, and, and you have Christianity. And I'm sorry, I just have not seen anything that is as compelling as the Christian message, both in terms of what it says about God and the world and about its power to actually make things happen in the world. Like, I'm a believer that our entire progress, even the way that we measure progress in society today, and the reason that we recognize that we've made something that we can call progress is because we all have that Christian mindset deeply in our bones of what progress looks like. And progress, we measure progress, even in our secular world, in terms of things like universal human flourishing. And if you look at the world, that's not the world as that, people think that's like the default human state. It's not. <laughs> that is universal human flourishing is like it is a standard that arose in the West in a particular context in a particular time, largely due to material prosperity. Because if you look at historically at the world, the historical uh, and even biological uh, d default is tribal success of your tribe over the other tribes, slavery, you know, oppression of, of those who are, you deem your enemies and who are competing, who are competing with you for the resources. Like Christianity is totally counterculture to that. It says, love your enemies, do good unto them who persecute you. Like what? <laughs> That's that's a very different ideology. And so the fact that we talk about social progress at all, I, I go, yes, we've made real moral progress, which means there's a real moral standard out there. And Christianity, of all of the worldviews out there, seems to be the one, in my opinion, that has the most legs under it, like real demonstrable fruits to both provide rational explanatory power uh, to the way that the world is, and also to provide um, the fruits, most importantly, both in that th that manifest in my own experience and in the experience of others. So that's how I. That's sort of the quick summary of kind of how I yeah. get from there's a God to why is it why why Jesus why not Allah or some other form of 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 theism. Yeah. So the level one is. Is there a God? The level two essentially is who is God? What kind of God do we have? And then kind of a brief summary, how would you describe the level three discussion? Yes, yeah, so the level three discussion is, okay, you believe in this Jesus of the New Testament. Now what? Now here's the thing. At that point, every one of us knows that story because that's what yeah, the, ch the church operates. With. It operates at level three. Like that's where the church does its work. It's, it's great messages to the Christian to say, Christians, those of you who seek Jesus Christ, we have a story to tell you and it's going to blow your mind because yeah. it isn't just some story that happened a long time ago. It's happening right now and you have the chance to come and join in the story and continue the work. And that's the great message of the restoration, right? And so at that point, the Joseph Smith story all of a sudden becomes incredibly compelling when you contrast the Joseph Smith story with the confused theology of traditional Christendom, when you compare the Joseph Smith story with the apostasy, with when you compare the Joseph Smith story to the Protestant sort of infighting and the, the what happens when you don't have ecclesiastical authority. 
And when you've lost, when you believe that the, that the Roman Catholic church is not, you know, God's one true church on the earth today. Right. So the problem is, is that it's almost like one of the things Latter-day Saints don't realize is you're usually not having conversation with people at level three. You're people, you're usually having conversations with people who aren't even at level one. Like, so why are we having level three conversations with people? Why aren't we having the level one conversation? Right. And once I yeah. did that, I also came to realize that most people are really like, I have way better sort of understandings of the level one conversation. And the real problem that people have is not at level three. The real problem people have is at level one or level two. People either are atheists, they don't believe in God, or they believe in God, but they're just some sort of a vague spiritualism, right? And that's where most people find themselves. They find themselves either as atheists or as I'm vaguely sort of religious. Now, you do have people that I would say are in the level three conversation. These are people who are Christians, will, will claim the title of a Christian. But if you ask them about their theology, ask them, do they, you know, do you believe in the Trinitarian? Do you believe in the Trinity? And what you'll find is like, for instance, and that's one of the core central Christian doctrines, and you'll find that most of them actually don't, in which case you're like, well, that's kind of a yeah. problem. If you're not going to accept the Trinity, like, you know, maybe you should talk with our missionaries. We got an interesting story to tell you about why, the, why you're right <laughs> and why yeah, the Trinity sure. is, you know, and, and other, and so you can have the, the comparative Christian conversation at level three, but, um, once I changed that mindset and began to realize where the conversation was to be had, I've had really, and, and you got to recognize this in yourself, like, where are you at? Like, do you really believe in God? Is that solid? And once you have that solidity, it's great. You feel like, man, I got a foundation here. And then you, and, and that was what sort of quote unquote saved my testimony was actually going deeper into the fundamentals and finding, I believe this stuff. And not only that, rationally, it is far more compelling, even just on the purely rational level, um, theism and Christianity than the alternatives. I love that. That's powerful. Um, and I think even just from like, yeah, like there's kind of the, like kind of that level two, level three area where the Jesus discussion where someone maybe has this powerful experience with Jesus. They're like, okay, this is a beautiful, this is a good thing. But, and I think from there, our message makes a lot of sense because I like just kind of for me, like, okay, you have this transformative relationship with Jesus Christ, but then is this being of love that you just experienced, is he really sending most of his children that or most of our brothers and sisters to hell? And I think like from right there, our message makes so much sense because it kind of a lot of those questions of like, okay, how do you reconcile Jesus with a loving God? Like, our tradition answers so many of those. Yeah. And a lot of people do this. They go into, they, they actually are what I call vague spiritualists, but they label that vague spiritualism, Jesus. Right. And so it's funny because like, they're like, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, but it's my Jesus. And it's like, okay. So basically you're a vague spiritualist, but you put the label of Jesus on it but your, your Jesus has nothing to do with the Jesus of actual scripture. Like we don't get to just make up Jesus. Like the cool thing is that there were actually people that were there with him <laughs> and we have very reliable records as to what they said. And should I go with your Jesus or the Jesus of the new Testament that we actually can authenticate that these documents go back very, very, very far are while not perfect, I'm not obviously a believer in, in biblical infallibility, but are very reliable. So it's like, should I trust you or should I trust Matthew? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah. so, so that's where we, um, that's one of those things that you have to be careful of because people may seem like they're in the level three conversation, but if, if you're really, if you haven't, if you don't embrace the New Testament as an authentic, you know, source as the what I'll call the best source of information on Jesus, I always ask people this: like, they say something about Jesus that's totally incoherent with the New Testament. You know, should I believe you or should I believe the New Testament? You know what I mean? Like, 
you're just making things up. Like these people were were actually like there. And I want to follow the Jesus, not my Jesus, not your Jesus. Like, and and so it's important to recognize that there are a lot of people that do that. And when th- and you have to recognize those people are not at level three. They have they they are at level two. They have some sort of a notion about God. They're giving that God the label Jesus, but unless you're unless it's consistent with the New Testament, then I don't have any real reason to take it serious. And so that leads you again, it narrows the field to New Testament Christianity um, and those who will base themselves in it. And frankly, I find our model just shockingly compelling when you actually study the New Testament and you go, wow, you know, Joseph wasn't just making stuff up. He was deeply concerned with, with, or the, I'll put it this way. The religion that came out of Joseph Smith is profoundly concerned with integration into the biblical text and into the Bible. And many people nowadays, you know, they're vague spiritualists. They don't care about integrating anything into any sort of uh, 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 historical text because, and that to me is just a sign that you're just making stuff up. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I kind of want to like fast forward, kind of go into a little bit of kind of a level three discussion and that being um, for those that kind of hold the premise, I guess, that like um, that Jesus is the Christ, um, that he works through prophets and such. Um, a question that a lot of people struggle with is how do you navigate the topic of prophetic fallibility? Um, I think we have a lot of members of the church. I was kind of one of these members who I kind of grew up knew, knowing that like in a sense that they were morally fallible, but thinking that everything that they taught was true. Um, and I had, I call it maybe like a junior faith crisis. I never, I still had things that I, I knew to be true. So I never really, leaving the church was never really a serious thought that I had. But I remember in high school coming across um, false doctrines like Curse of Cain um, and like interracial marriage being a sin um, and things like that. And really kind of feeling this cognitive dissonance because at that time I had this conception that prophets couldn't make mistakes. And I feel like after my mission, I've kind of, I've kind of found different ways for me to personally deal with it. But I feel like, yeah, people learn about those, those issues. They learn about Kirtland Safety Society or Adam God or different things like that. And I think a lot of people can kind of go from one side of the pendulum of having these unrealistic expectations um, to the other side of the pendulum where whenever a prophet disagrees with their personal beliefs, um, the prophet's always wrong. And if the prophet's always wrong, whenever they disagree with us, what's the purpose of even having a prophet (laughs) in the first place? Yep. Yep. So what are kind of some things that help you to navigate this issue of prophetic fallibility? So I, it's funny because this issue is ultimately I, I answer it by saying I replace prophetic fallibility with prophetic reliability. There's a, an analogy that I use is I use this, this, this is an analogy that I use. Okay. Imagine you got a room with the 12 greatest brain surgeons in the world and you put them all into a room together. Okay. And you now, now I, I could ask the question, are those people infallible? No, of course not. They're not. They're, they're, they're fallible human beings, just like all the rest of us. However, if I were to ask you, are those people a reliable source of information about the uh, about brain surgery and what I should do with the brain cancer that I have? Yes. And so I go, okay, so prophets are not infallible, but, and, and now, now here's the other, the question is, what if they're not reliable? Well, if they're not reliable, well then, yeah, then I would, I would say then yes, you should leave the church. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. If God, if these people are not, do not show in any way that they have any uh, connection to God, well, then this ain't the church for you. And and because they're not what they claim to be, they're not being led by the Lord, right? But the thing is, is you also got to evaluate under what criteria are you judging them? 
I, I believe, and, and in fact, you can look at science itself and the scientific authorities. Does this mean that there's no such thing as scientific authorities? Of course there are, and we should pay heed to them. But scientific authorities make mistakes as well. But what we can do is we can recognize that science itself has progressed. And indeed, there are great scientific minds throughout history that have produced all of the amazing technological and scientific advances that we experience. Okay. So I look at the brethren as people who have been given a special stewardship over the world. Okay. In the matters that pertain, pertain to life and salvation to how do we connect with God? And I will say, I have not, and I don't just mean our 12 or 15 living prophets, seers, and revelators. I take the whole collective witness of all of them. That's what scripture is. Scripture is a collection of the words of the prophets. So I want to look at not only the living prophets, but all of them. And I want to look at that entire source and say, hmm, is there, again, don't compare things to utopia. Compare them to what the alternatives are. Is there any better source for understanding the nature of God and Christ and salvation than that, than that body of uh, people? And I say no. I have not found it. And if you have, please come on my show. I want to hear about it. Like I want to talk about it. I would love to. I always tell people this. This is the truest thing I have found. And I want to find things that might be truer. So if you think you have a better model for understanding God and salvation and the way to live than the, than the prophets over all of time, then please come and talk to me about it. I have not found it. And therefore, I have placed my faith in the institution of prophets and, po and apostles called by God who can help to reveal his general will to the world, and they need not be infallible. Okay. Now, one other thing on this there's a temptation and a desire for finding the trump card, for finding the thing that is 100% right every time, right? This is kind of where biblical inerrancy comes up. Okay. This is what I call the, 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 um, authority alone heresy. It's the idea that, and this is what the Calvinists do, for instance, is, or actually Calvinists especially, but, but technically all, anyone who holds to uh, scriptural infallibility, why does infallibility matter to people so much? Why isn't reliability good enough? The reason why is because they want something where they can turn off their brain, turn off their faith, and just say, if they say it, it's true, man, this feels great. Like I have this, it's like the, it's like a direct phone line to God, man. I can just, I don't have to exercise faith. It's just like, I can turn off my brain. I can be blindly obedient. And I just, that's it. But that's not what God wants. That's actually, that's a false and wrong presupposition. And it's a false temptation to want to have this thing that is the ultimate trump card of all uh, where, where you no longer have to exercise faith and mm -hmm. you don't develop that way. And so one of the things is, is why does anyone think that there's any, like there's a presupposition out there that people have that there is some infallible source of truth that they can get at, whether that be the Bible, whether that be the living pro prophets and apostles, and it's just wrong. And so the best you're going to find is reliability and I have found no source for the question of what is God's general will to the world, okay, which is different from his maybe particular revelation to me for my stewardship. But is there anyone who is a who is as Peter and Moses? Does that exist today? And I have found nothing more compelling uh, than the story of the restoration. I love that. Another, I think, analogy that can be helpful. This is one that I, I read in a blog article by J. Max Wilson. Um, but he talks about so Ezekiel three. There's kind of the analogy of like prophets being a watchman on a tower. Um, and I look at it. I think it can be helpful to also view our leaders as okay, they're on a tower. So even if just maybe let's just say in theory that maybe spiritually 
they're just as spiritual as we are. The fact that they're on a tower, they're able to see things that we don't see. And then I also look at it. Okay. I mean, there's one watchman on a tower. Um, he sees things we don't see, but sure. He's still fallible. Well, what if we had 15 watchmen on a tower? There's going to be this, once again, not infallibility, but a reliability that we can have in that. It doesn't mean we shut off our brains. It doesn't mean we, we trust blindly, but there's a confidence that we can have in that. Yes. And I would say, but I would say it's more than 15. I would say, take every living apostle and prophet that have existed in the entire history of the earth. That's what the scriptures are. And I look at all of them. So if, if there's some doctrine that you know, comes out and Brigham Young is teaching Adam God. And I look in the scriptures and I'm like, hey, this doesn't seem to line up with kind of everybody else. Maybe I, I will lower my level of confidence in maybe what someone is saying if it doesn't seem to align with what all of the other witnesses say. Truth can't contradict itself. And so now that doesn't mean that I reject what a prophet is saying. And I even will recognize his ability to say it um, in the sense of that, yeah, it's his call to, to to say that this is the way things are. I may disagree. I may not fight against him, you know, whatever. But there's an idea here of, um, and that's a different conversation about institutional integrity. But for me personally forming my opinions about, you know, okay, you just said something. Why, like if if Brigham Young goes out and teaches Adam God, or he has a particular interpretation about the curse of Cain, but I find that it doesn't align with what all of the other prophets have said over time throughout scripture. I'm going to be, I am justified in having a lower level of confidence about that particular subject, right? But what I find is actually the opposite happens a lot of the time. Like there's a very consistent spiritual witness over the entire scriptural record and backed up by modern living prophets. And yet people are um, like, like I'll, I'll just use an example, you know, the big elephant in the room and all the conversations like, you know, gay marriage or, you know, the legitimacy of same sex uh, sexual relations. Yeah. I'm sorry. The scriptural record is very clear. The record of all of our living uh, apostles and prophets in the modern era since Joseph Smith, very clear. And so yeah. if, if, even if, an apostle were to come out and say, the Lord thinks it's okay, I would be, I would have a, I would go, wait a minute here. Like the standard by which I judge a living apostle and prophet's words is, does it have to be consistent with what past uh, apostles and prophets have said? Now, I want to caveat this a little bit. It doesn't mean I don't believe there can't be anything new revealed, but that revelation must in some way be consistent with um, with what God has already revealed, right? If a prophet comes out and say, Jesus never rose from the dead, it's all a big metaphorical story, right? Like, on what grounds do we say that he's wrong? If you just have this authority alone paradigm, then you just would have to believe it because the authority yeah. said it. But we don't have to do that. And we're not supposed to do that. God, like you said, there is a reason that there is a collective witness of God's prophets. And it's, and it's great because then you don't have to worry if one of them says something that, that, you know, if Brigham Young's going off on his own little tangent about whatever, you can go, uh, maybe that's Brigham. It doesn't seem to align with the rest of the, of the prophetic canon that's out there. And, yeah. and that's, I think, a much better way to, to look at it um, when, you're, when you're evaluating different doctrines and ideas that are out there. Yeah. So here's kind of a scenario for you, Jacob. Let's just imagine that you're a Latter-day Saint um, in the early 70s. Um, so like the declaration to like the priest of going, the priest and temple blessings going to all worthy members, um, the black mm -hmm. members that happened in 1978. So let's just say it's early 70s. Um, what does you sustaining the brethren at that time period look like, even if maybe you disagree with the policy that's currently going on. Okay. So let me, let me actually address one thing before I get to that. So okay. a lot of people ask me like, oh, well, you would have, you would have believed all this beforehand actually. And I think that they were operating on light, with limited light and knowledge. But the problem is that the scriptures have never supported a priesthood ban on sub-Saharan Africans. 
Okay. The scriptures that are used to justify that have nothing to do with sub-Sahara Africa. Like the, the scriptures about Egyptus and, and the curse of Cain, and the seed of Ham, those interpretations of those verses have like, we didn't ban the priesthood to Egyptians. <laughs> we did The people in those verses are all part of Near Eastern cultures. In the 1800s, there was a belief amongst Protestants that was very common that the curse of Cain and the curse of Ham had to do with sub-Saharan Africans. And there's very, there's very real cultural reasons why that was the case. But my argument would be, I do not, like, we can say today, I believe confidently, that the scriptures do not support the notion of a ban on the priesthood for sub-Saharan Africans. It just doesn't support it. And therefore, and the scriptures existed in 1970 and in 1900. And so, in other words, the, the reason that I reject what Brigham Young taught and implemented in relation to that issue is because of the scriptures. It's because it's the exact same issue that we were just talking about. It is the, the whole scriptural canon, right, that, that seems to contradict what Brigham and then even other leaders after Brigham, Brigham said on the matter. And then they eventually said, yep, we were all wrong. Ignore all of it. You know, McConkie was like, yeah, we, we, we got it wrong, guys. And, and that's fine. I don't have to like lose my faith over that. I can recognize that that happened. Now, now you're asking the question, okay, but you're living in 1975 and you don't believe this. You've done the research and you're like, I don't believe it. Like, what do you do? I think brother or brother elder Corbett, his talk that he recently gave, gave a brilliant answer. You work within the priesthood structures that exist. You don't undermine them, right? I would make my case to my state president. I would say, "Hey, I don't, you know, believe this," and I would, and I would speak with priesthood leaders and explain why I didn't believe in those particular policies. I would not go out and publicly advocate against the church, but I would also let people know that I don't believe this for the following reasons, right? And the reason that I would work within the structures of the priesthood authority is because to do otherwise is to undermine that authority. It's to undermine the structure of the church. And I'm a believer that institutional integrity matters because if you undermine the institutional integrity of the church, the structure under which people are given stewardship, you end up with Protestantism (laughs) and that's a problem. And if you don't deal with the Protestant problem, the problem of everyone doing their own thing, then you, you destroy the church. So you end up just like to try and make the church better, you actually end up destroying it. And I think Elder Corbett's wonderful talk, he explains how that works and why it works. It's not about blind obedience. It's about the recognition that certain people are given certain authority to make the call. You can talk with those people in authority and explain why you think they might be making the wrong call. But you can't go out and rally the troops against them and undermine their authority to make the call itself. Because when you do that, that destroys the church. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I like, I like the way you put that. And like, like there's a, there's a reason the Catholic church is so big and that it's been able to survive so long is because there is kind of that, there is that structure on, and I think that's been part of like the the church growing at the rate it, at it has. Um, we have that structure where even though obviously, like we said, it, it's reliable. It, I think it's the church is a very good thing. But even though it's imperfect, it's been able to continue to grow so that more people on the earth are able to receive those ordinances of salvation and exaltation. Yep, and that's and that is that's the problem with Protestantism, and people don't deal with it. Is that what happens? Is you you break it all up. There's a there's a famous story in church history um, that everyone should be aware of, and it's the story of the Godbyites. And uh, William Godby um, was a I believe it was William Godby was his name. Um, I know Godby's the last name, um, but Godby was a uh, convert to the church, kind of an intellectual type. Um, and he and some others had some issues with what Brigham was doing uh, in, in the 1800s in the church. In Utah. And frankly, I think to some extent they had some grounds for it. You know what I mean? Um, and 
But where they went wrong is they began to kind of publicly go out and attack the church and publicly speak out kind of against the brethren and rally sort of support against Brigham. Okay. Actually, what's interesting is they ended up going totally apostate at some point and they founded the uh, Salt Lake Tribune. <laughs> so everyone who knows the Salt Lake Tribune, just so you all know, it is a God BI anti-Mormon paper from its inception. So just so we're all clear on that and its roots. Um, and so anyway, Brigham Young, they, they brought in Godby and they had a conversation about like what's going on. And it was interesting because he kind of, their argument was essentially what, what a lot of people's argument is, is look, we don't accept, we, we, we like, we're willing to sustain you Brigham, but you're not infallible here. And Brigham essentially said to them, yeah, I know <laughs> he said that. But what he said, he said, and I'm going to read directly. This is uh, from Leonard Arrington's book, American Moses, uh, his, his biography of Brigham Young. He says, now said Brigham, what would happen if every person goes his or her own way? What confusion, what discord, what discontent, what hatred would soon creep into the bosom of individuals against one another? And I think about it and I go, he's exactly right. He's talking about the Protestant problem. He says, I'm not infallible. Brigham said, I'm not infallible, but the priesthood that I hold is. And, th and, and some people like, if you think of the priesthood as the structure, that this is the way God has put together his kingdom on earth. He puts imperfect people into these positions. And so that's why there are failures. But you have to be careful that if you're railing against someone or you have an issue with the person that you're not tearing down the structure itself in the process because the structure itself is the reason that we're able to stay together as a church and not splinter off into various groups. And it's the reason that all of the groups that have splintered off eventually fall apart. Because if you get people who reject institutional authority all together in a room and try and get them to create an institutional authority, it falls apart really fast. And so that's the problem with Protestantism. So the thing is, is that if we want to avoid the Protestant problem in the church, we have to recognize that we have to work within the church. Now, at some point you have to say, well, if all these people are unreliable and this whole thing is super corrupt and all of that, then you, then you have to go to the, the great apostasy issue. You have to say, well, it's an apostate institution. This is not the institution of God, in which case, why are you a member of this church? <laughs> like, like, if you don't sustain the... You have to ask them, what's the church? Now, you can give the Protestant answer and say, well, it's just the collection of the believers. Like, no, it's not. That is not the Latter-day Saint answer to that question. The Latter-day Saint answer to the question is, yes, that's maybe partly it, but it's the, it's the institutional structure of the priesthood. That is what the church is, fundamentally. And so, because you can have all sorts of people that believe, but that isn't the church. The church is this institution that is created by the structures of the authority that are there. And so you have to be careful because if you fight against the structure, you're fighting against the church. Yeah, I think that's powerful. And I just think like it, just kind of the, the unanimity factor, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of safety that can happen in that. And one thing that I've just kind of noticed as I've researched a lot of these different issues is a lot of things that I look at as having probably been mistakes, um, that process wasn't always followed. But I think we're kind of with the, with the restoration being ongoing. I think we're a lot more diligent T today. Our leaders are a lot more diligent and making sure that they follow that process. Once again, I expect that there is mistakes and that there will be mistakes in the future. I don't have the expectation of infallibility, but I do feel like we follow that process of unanimity in DNC 107 a lot better today than we used to. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a great thing. And I, and I, and, and the other thing is, is like, we believe in councils in the church. You know, if, if you've ever been in a position of church leadership, you've been counseled to talk with your counselors. And then like, if you're a bishop, talk with the Relief Society president, talk with the young women's president. Like there's a reason that you have these ward council meetings. It's so that we can, we can come to hopefully a consensus about certain issues. Yes. Ultimately authorities 
are the authority and they get to make the final call. But a good person who's honoring their priesthood will listen to both the people below them, you know, below them, quote, in, in air quotes there, and people higher in the authority structure above them when it comes to things like the living apostles and prophets and the doctrine. And then they try and utilize revelation within their own stewardship to come up with uh, the best solution for for their stewardship. And, and another thing I always do with, with prophets, like, here's the thing. I can be all judgmental about how Russell M. Nelson is handling his stewardship, but boy, maybe I should turn that around and look at how I handle my own. Because I actually, and, and this is maybe, maybe people disagree with this, but it's my belief. I don't think God cares more about how Russell M. Nelson, or I would say this, God is just as willing to reveal his will to Russell M. Nelson about his stewardship as he is to me about my stewardship. I don't believe yeah, that President they're- President taught that, I believe, yeah. Yeah, and, and so I don't look at them as these like, I, I think we get into this weird like superheroism. Now, granted, I do think these are wonderful, good deeply connected men to the Lord. I do believe that. But when we start to create these sort of superhero powers that they're supposed to have, I think you're setting up an unrealistic fantasy expectation. I believe that all of us are entitled to revelation and dreams and visions and all the spiritual gifts of God are just as much available to us as they are to the prophets of God who run the church. They just are different matters of stewardship. They have a stewardship that's different than mine. It's not that I'm some, you know, peasant and they're the great, wonderful Wizard of Oz. Like, that's not the way that this works. We are all children of God. We simply have different stewardships. And God has called these people to have particular stewardships. And frankly, they do a much better job, so far as I can tell, with their stewardship than I do with mine. <laughs> yeah, I think that's powerful. I'm... Before we go to the last question, is there just any other aspects of the infallibility issue that you'd want to bring up to our audience? No, just, just to reiterate, don't search for infallibility, search for reliability and be okay with that. Because I think I have a strong testimony of the reliability of God's prophets, both ancient and modern. Yeah, I think that's powerful and that's really important to remember. So the question that I want to end with, Jacob, is just what does the gospel of Jesus Christ mean to you? I thought about that. You, you'd sent me that question to think about. Um, so the gospel is, first and foremost, is the word is the good news. Well, what's the good news? <laughs> the good news of Jesus Christ coming and dying for our sins. Well, what does that mean or matter? Why do I care about that? I think the most compelling part of the Christian message, in my opinion, is it well it's the dichotomy of fall and redemption that's the essence of the christian message it's the good news of our redemption from the fall but many people don't take the time to actually think about the the fact that we live in a fallen world i think if they take a little time to reflect on that you'll realize like the world's a messed up place <laughs> it's really messed up it's unfair it's awful terrible things happen even when I have good things happen, it's like good things happen, but I don't necessarily deserve it. And you end up in this situation where you look at this unfair world and you go, oh, so human beings come into this world, totally unfair, live, suffer. Some of us have a better go of it than others, and then we die and cease to exist. It's actually a really awful story. And where the restoration, where the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ, the message of Christianity at level two is redemption. It's no, let, let me tell you the good news. That isn't the end of the story. It, it's a story of pain and suffering that gets redeemed and that every wrong will be made right. All accounts will be balanced in the end. And Jesus Christ makes it possible for all of those accounts to be balanced. And all you have to do is place your faith and trust in him, do your best to follow him, listen to him, and it will all be redeemed. It'll all be okay. Like those words, like it's all going to be okay, is that's what the gospel, the good news is. And if you ask why, 
the answer is Jesus Christ. And I think that's what the gospel is to me. That's why I have placed my faith in it, I say, because I can't think like there seems to be me to, there's nothing more clear to me in the world than that we live in a fallen world. The only question is, is there any redemption? And in my opinion, Jesus Christ represents that redemption. He is that redemption. And so that's where I've placed my faith. That's where I've placed my chips. And so I've become his disciple. I seek to follow him in my life. I do a really bad job. I'm kind of like, I like to, I don't identify with Nephi so much. He just was always doing what's right. I'm more of a Peter. I go in, I'm, ah, I'm going to help you, Jesus. Cutting I off cut, off some, and... <laughs> cut off an ear and then he's like, oh, you idiot. And he heals the ear. Like, shut up, Peter. Like, you know, and so I, I fall into the water and drowned and then he picks me up. And, and that's more the way that I feel of my own spiritual journey. But at the end of it, I want to try and follow him. And I encourage everyone else to do the same. That's, that's my testimony. I love that, Jacob. Thanks so much for taking the time to be on. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. So do you enjoy the content here on Thoughtful Faith? If so, be sure to hit the notification bell. This ensures that our new videos show up on your feed. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group called Thoughtful Saints, where myself and others discuss the sorts of topics found on this channel. And lastly, if you think other people would benefit from this video, please be sure to share it.